Okay, so we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11. <laughs> we're going to continue looking at Hebrews chapter 11. We're um, talking there about all the definitions that the Bible provides for faith. And, uh, you know, among the things that is recorded there is that by faith, the elders or those of old received their commendation. I have a few things to say about commendation um, from the standpoint of the, the language there to understand what's meant by that, but I want to go fairly quickly into the first example of somebody being commended by faith, which is Abel. So we'll be looking at commended as righteous, but we'll be looking fairly specifically at Abel. But it is Hebrews 11 that says faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen, and the means by which the people of old received their commendation. So when we say the people of old, we mean the elders, those that came before the, the ancient nation of Israel, for example. And in fact, uh, they're the, uh, among those who are recorded here in the 11th chapter, but there are others who are recorded here in the 11th chapter who are the people of old, those that came before, in, in uh, years before, centuries before, prior to our existence, who are nonetheless our fathers, our ancestors, because of the common faith that we have, that we share together. They received a commendation by means of their faith. So that's the idea. And the fourth verse is where you talk about Abel, let me say about this commendation, the word for commendation is, is a testimony, um, the testimony given by a witness in court. Um, when we say they received their commendation, we mean it was testified about them. They, they received a testimony. Somebody spoke on their behalf. Uh, registering their rightness, you know, a supporting witness. Which leaves, of course, uh, <laughs> the major question of, well, who is the witness? <laughs> That's the point. When he formulates it in the second verse, the people of old received a testimony. But he doesn't say who testified. That shoe is waiting to drop, and it drops in the fourth verse. <laughs> By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So Abel, by means of faith, offered a sacrifice that was a better one. And through this faith, he was commended as righteous, meaning he received the testimony that he was right, that he was just. He was vindicated in court, you might say. And who commended him? God commended him by accepting his gifts. And through faith, though he died, he still speaks. But the commendation came from God. And it's interesting to me that in this first example of somebody receiving a commendation by faith, he, he, you know, makes a, a real point of it, saying it twice, you know, that he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. So it's God whom we are trying to please. It's God whose commendation we, we seek, and we may or may not have the commendation of other people around us, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't, but the one that you're looking for, you know, whom are we seeking to please? Is it man or is it God? And the one you're looking for is God if you are walking by faith, if you live the faith of Hebrews 11. So Abel was able to offer a better sacrifice than Cain did by means of faith. There's actually three things happening here in this fourth verse of Hebrews 11. 
First, by faith, Abel offers a better sacrifice. Next, also by faith, or by means of, or through faith, Abel was commended as righteous. And finally, by faith, or through faith, Abel still speaks, despite death. There's three things happening there in the fourth verse of Hebrews 11, all of them by means of faith. Because he believed in God, because he trusted God, something happened, and that's what we're looking at. (laughs) First thing is, he offered a better sacrifice. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain did. And that's the first thing that we'll look at here. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 4, and I would turn you there. Um, You can hold your place at Hebrews if you like, but looking at Genesis 4, it's verses 3 through 5 where the record tells us what happened. It says in the third verse, In the course of time Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions, And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Two brothers offered, right? You got two different offerings here. Cain offers, Abel offers, but we're told quite precisely in the fourth and fifth verses that the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain... And his offering, the Lord had no regard. What we mean by this is that a person is as the person does. As this this thing that is offered determines what kind of person that is. When God doesn't accept the offering of Cain, he doesn't accept Cain. When he doesn't accept the offering, or he does accept the offer of Abel, he accepts Abel. The person is as the person offers. And I don't know if there's a better summary of living the life of God. (laughs) You are what you do. You live for God or you don't. You choose God's things or you don't. You seek his pleasure or you don't. Well, Abel sought the Lord by faith, and this meant that God regarded his offering, though he did not have regard for Uh, Cain's offering. But if you look at it a little more closely, we again, we got two brothers. We have two offerings. One of the offerings is acceptable. One of the offerings is not acceptable. What's the difference between them? Um, Some have said that they think it is the things that were offered, that Cain brought uh, fruit of the ground and Abel brought animals of the flock. But, you know, there's no basis for that. It doesn't tell us what God asked for on the one hand. On the other hand, the law of Moses makes provision for all kinds of offerings of both things. They're both acceptable. That doesn't seem to be at issue here. Rather, I would focus in on the difference between verse 3 and 4 being that Cain brought to the Lord an offering. Abel brought the firstborn and their fat portions. Abel brought the best, is what that means. They both brought something. They both offered something. You know, they both showed up at the worship services of the Lord. (laughs) But one of them brought the best in service to God. One of them just brought. And one of those things is acceptable to God, and one of those things is not acceptable to God. Being there is good. You should be there. But if you're not worshiping in spirit and in truth, if your heart is not in the songs that you sing when we're to be making melody with the heart, teaching and admonishing one another, that can't be acceptable to God. God has to have the first. He has to have the best. Abel offered the best. Cain just just brought He brought something, you know? I'm here, what more do you want? (laughs) Well, what God wants is our hearts. Cain's heart is not in it. 
That's what's happening in Genesis 4. You can see the difference between their offerings is that Abel gave the best. That's the meaning in Hebrews 11.4 when it said he offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain did. Cain offered a sacrifice, but it, it was not as good because Abel offered the best. It was a real sacrifice. The firstborn of the flock, their fat portions. What does it mean? It means that by faith, if you will, because Abel believed in God, because he trusted God, he knew something. He understood something about who God is. He knew the nature of God. He was able to draw a conclusion about this, that God must have the best. God cannot take less than the best. How could I show up and offer less than the best to God? Isn't he the most high? Isn't he the creator of all the earth? Well, by faith you know these things, and by faith you live this way, and you make these kinds of offerings in your own life. But it's telling us that he was able to know something about God's nature. He was able to understand something, to draw a conclusion that drove how he lived, what he did. That's what it is to live by faith. And I think that's uh, the simplest approach to the first thing here, that Abel offered a better sacrifice. That's what's better about it. Now, the next thing is that Abel, through faith in Hebrews 11, 4, was commended as righteous, God commending him, by accepting his gifts, and that we need to talk about in a little bit more detail. Talking about commendation from God, he was commended by means of faith when God accepted his gifts. And that's what we read back there in Genesis 4, verse 4, the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. That's the specific example of somebody here in Hebrews 11 receiving a commendation from God. God testified about him that he was righteous. How did God testify about him? Well, he testified about him by accepting the gifts that he offered. If you will, he testifies about Cain too. Right? This tells us that Cain did wrong because he wouldn't accept Cain's offering. But we're talking about Abel being commended. God commends what is right. He commends what is just. It's the Lord whose commendation we seek. Okay. But when you talk about commendation and righteousness, you know, these words I think we should get into a little bit more detail. Again, that commendation is a testimony. But I want to talk about righteous as well, which is uh, not often understood. <laughs> you know, the word righteousness is the same as the word justice. You know, being righteous does not mean being very good at surfing, <laughs> as it is very commonly used. Righteous means justice or just, that somebody is right, that they have been found innocent in court. They have been vindicated in their cause in court. They're, they're just, they're right, they're um, in the right. And when God declares somebody to be righteous, when, somebody, when God says that he is righteous by accepting his gifts, God is testifying about him. And the other way of looking at this, declaring him to be righteous, since righteousness is justice, the other word for that is justified. God, When God declares somebody righteous, God justifies him. That's the meaning of justify in your New Testament. When you read about by this, a man is justified. Well, it means he's declared just. He has receives a testimony that he is right. By faith, Hebrews 11 tells us, the life of faith is what produces that. 
But when God declares somebody righteous, God justifies them. That's the same exact meaning. It's the same exact word at its base. So when it says he, he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, it's literally saying it was testified that Abel was just. God testifying about him upon receipt of his gifts. That's a, an important thing in the fourth verse that we're talking about not just uh, uh, what happened, that he has a testimony and that he's right and God says he's right, but how did that happen? It happened when God was in receipt of the gifts that Abel offered. When Abel made the offering, which is exactly the figure in James chapter 2. And uh, probably you want to go there because I have a handful of verses. But it's exactly the figure in James chapter 2. And I want us to look at this together because it is very clearly related and intertwined in the idea of commendation. James 2, it's 20 down to 24. Do you want to be shown, foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. It's the only verse in all of Scripture that says the words faith alone. It's James 2.24. A person is justified by works and not by faith alone. But justified, meaning he was declared righteous, which is what God does. It's what God did to Abel when he offered. So also... Abraham, it says in James 2, especially verse 21, was justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. He was declared righteous by God upon the offering of Isaac, when he offered Isaac. And really, when he offered is what's at issue here in James 2, although it's clear that, you know, we have to love in deed and not just in word. That's fairly clear. But what he's really trying to get at here is the timing, the timeline, the mechanism, the sequence of events. Abraham is declared to be righteous when he takes this action, offering up Isaac on the altar. It says this in the 22nd verse by faith, or his faith was completed by his works. It started with faith, but the works are following this, and it's not complete without the works. But when did it start with faith? Well, it was the 23rd verse of James 2, Scripture, the Scripture was fulfilled, meaning the, what had been written before this was fulfilled when he offered Isaac. What was fulfilled? This Scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So he was counted righteous when he believed God, it says, But that belief is the same word as faith up above in all these verses in Hebrews 11 and in James 2. That belief was completed by these works. When, you know, when did that happen? Well, it's Genesis chapter 15, if you turn there with me. Let's go back to Genesis together for just a little bit. It's Genesis 15. There in verses 2 through 6, 
Abram brings up to God, what will you give me for I continue childless? Behold, you've given me no offspring. You know, a slave born in my house will be my heir. And the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, your very own son will be your heir. Genesis 15, 4. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven, verse 5, number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness, which means he reckoned him to be righteous. Because he believed God when God said to him, you're going to have descendants as numerous as these stars, God considered him to be righteous. This is before he has Isaac. He does not have Isaac. He has not had this child that God promised him, the son of promise. But before he has these children, before he has uh, Isaac, God tells him that he will have these descendants, and he believes that. And when he believes that, he's considered righteous. But you have to fast forward to 22 of Genesis before you understand what James 2 is trying to tell us. He was declared righteous, or not declared righteous, excuse me. He was considered righteous, counted righteous, when he believed God that he would have offspring, but that was before he had Isaac. Now in Genesis 22, he has Isaac, the son of promise, the son of his old age. Isaac, who is born miraculously insofar as Abraham was 100 years old, Sarah was 90, and had been barren her entire life. But God said to them that she would have a son, and she did. He's the son of promise. He's the son through whom the uh, genealogy will be reckoned in the faith. And in Genesis 22, the Lord says to him, it says these, uh, God tested Abraham and said, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, took the young men and his son Isaac. He got up immediately and went and did this thing that God told him to do. He believed God when God said, you're going to have offspring and numerous offspring. But now God is testing him, this one child, Isaac, through whom the rest will come. He says to him, you go over there and offer him as a burnt offering. And you find at verse 10, after they get there, Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. See what he said? Now I know. Everybody knows what that means. He was testing him. He went and did it. He passed the test. God considered him to be righteous before, but he hadn't been tested. Now he's been tested. Now I know that you fear God. Abraham is justified by the work of offering, like Abel was justified by the work of offering. He had faith, you know, he believed him. But as James said, this thing that was written before he was 
he believed God and he was considered to be right, was fulfilled, completed, when he offered his son, and God now declares him to be right. Now I know you fear God, literally declaring him to be just because he's passed this test. He believed before, but now it's verified. Now it's vindicated. Now we know this is true faith. He has been tested and he has stood the test. He's not one that springs up quickly, but in time of trial falls away. That's not the way that Abraham is. He remains faithful. But don't stop there. The 15th verse of the 22nd chapter of Genesis continues, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand on the seashore, and your offspring will possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring will all nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. These are the great promises. I'll multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, as the sand on the seashore. Every, every you know, I, I wasn't raised in the church. I didn't have those Bible classes, but I'm told that every children's Bible class asked what the promises to Abraham were and that these are they. Offspring multiplied as the stars of heaven and the sand on the seashore. In your offspring will all nations of the earth be blessed. Yes, these are the great promises. When did these promises come? It was not Genesis 15. When he believed God, who told him he would have these descendants, and he was considered to be righteous, he was, and that's good. But that's not when the promises were came. The promises came in Genesis 22. Not before his works, but after his works. Not by faith alone, but by faith and works together. That's when the promises are made. That's when the promises uphold. And as God said to him, it's because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, the 16th verse, which, by the way, in Genesis 22, 16, which, by the way, is what God is doing. God did not withhold his son, his only son, so that you and I could be saved from our sins. Why does he have these blessings? Because the 18th verse, you have obeyed my voice. He didn't just believe what God said. He backed that up with action. He backed that up with obedience. And back there in Hebrews 11, where we started, looking at Abel in the fourth verse, Abel also is being justified by works. God commends him on receipt of those gifts. God commends him by accepting his gifts. Abraham's justified when he offers Isaac, not before. Though he believed God and he was considered righteous, he was untested. Now that he's tested, he's justified. And we also see that Abel is justified by works, not just when he believes God and shows up as even Enoch, or I'm sorry, not Enoch, as even uh, Cain believed God and showed up, but when he knew that God must have the best and he made an offering that was the best, then he was declared right by God. And you and I are justified by works too. You and I will be declared just in the same way. When you believe in God, when you believe what he has said, you believe in the resurrection of his son Jesus, 
you will be justified when you offer yourself in obedience to God through baptism. That's the New Testament pattern. It's What we're getting at is it's nothing new. It's always been like this. God is the same God. He hasn't changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's the same God. It's true that we have a different law now, that the law of Moses was our tutor to bring us to Christ, and now Christ has come, and his law is the law of liberty. I understand that. But it's not because the law of Moses was sin. There was, it was not sin. There was not sin in doing the law of Moses. It wasn't wrong. It was right. It just had a purpose, and that purpose was subservient to the purpose of Christ. And we're going to be justified in this new law, in this new way. And I would submit to you the idea of baptism by by way of Acts chapter 2, or I'm sorry, by way of Acts, actually, the entire book. If you think about it this way, um, you know, as I thought about this, um, one of the most important things to, to understand about baptism in, in the law of Christ is that everybody did it. When you look in the book of Acts, you know, you got so many examples. In Acts 2, 38, Peter told those who were cut to the heart, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. When do we get forgiveness? When we have repented and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. When was Abel justified? When he offered the first, th- the firstborn and the fat. When was Abraham justified? When he offered Isaac. You believe God, that's good. As they believed, but the commandment to them was not just to believe, but to repent and to obey him for the forgiveness. And in Acts 2.41, those who received that word were baptized. It's clear that that's what they did. In Acts 8, you have the 12th and 13th verses, a, a, a man uh, who's not uh, is not one of the apostles, he's just preaching the gospel, but you have a a crowd of Samaritans who believe, and Simon, who had been a sorcerer, or at that time was a sorcerer, came to believe, and both they and he were baptized, Acts 8, 12, and 13. You find that they were baptized, he was baptized, those who believed were baptized. In Acts 8, uh, further down there in 35, uh, down to 38th verse, you have uh, that same preacher now has found a traveling man, an Ethiopian, who's a servant of the queen. He's a eunuch in Ethiopia, but he's a displaced Jew. And the preacher preached to him the good news about Jesus, Acts 8.35 says. What did he do? The first thing out of his mouth is, look, here's water. What now hinders me from being baptized? And the 38th verse tells you very plainly that they went down into the water together. He baptized him and they came back up. In Acts chapter 9, you got Saul of Tarsus in the 18th verse, who knew that what he was fighting was actually the truth. And when he repented, he arose and was baptized, which is also what was recounted in 22.16 of Acts, that the man sent to Paul to wake him up, said to him, why, why do you, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized, calling on the Lord's name, which is what he did. In Romans 10, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 10, verses 47 and 48, you have this this Roman household of Cornelius and his family. They brought Peter because the Spirit told them that Peter had words by which they must be saved, and he did. And when they believed, they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, as Peter said. In fact, Peter commanded in the exact same wording as he had used in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts 16, 14 and 15, you have Lydia, a seller of purple, who paid attention to what was being said. 
And she was baptized, she and her household. That's what it is to pay attention in God's eyes. In Acts 16.33, a Philippian jailer also believed when the jail was opened that contained Paul and his traveling companions. And that jailer also was baptized, he and his household. In Acts 18, in verse 8, you have Corinthians believing and being baptized. In Acts 19, verses 4 and 5, those at Ephesus who had heard only up through the baptism of John until that point came to believe in Jesus and were baptized in the name of Jesus. It's just to say it's what they did. It's what they always did. There's more to it than just belief. There's a justification or a commendation from God when you finally take the plunge, (laughs) when you finally do this and become a Christian, a child of God, to obtain for yourself forgiveness of sins. I want to look finally at this idea that Abel still speaks despite death, as the Scripture says to us. These are closing thoughts. But back there in Hebrews 11.4, it says that through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. I want to look at that with you for but a moment. If we look together back at Genesis 4, you can see, specifically in the 8th verse, that after God does not accept Cain's offering, and God reasons with Cain that you can do better, it says Cain spoke to Abel his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Genesis 4, verse 8. It's a conversation before death. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, he rose up against him and killed him. Why did it tell us that Cain spoke to Abel? Well, you know why it told us that. Cain's upset that God isn't accepting his offering, and he thinks that when he goes crying to Abel about this, he's going to find a sympathetic ear. That is not what Cain found, is it? That's not what happened. It's 1 John chapter 3, if you want to look at that. It's 1 John 3 that tells you, In the 12th and 13th verses, it said we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's deeds were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. You see what happened? Abel did not take his brother's side. He stood with God. But you know, the word here in 1 John 3 is very powerful and I think needs to be noted. When it says Cain murdered his brother, this is actually the word for ritual sacrifice, not murder. Cain was of the evil one and sacrificed his brother. Why did he offer him in sacrifice? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. That is the word. Uh, It's kind of terrible, but that's what it says. And it's very plain about this. It makes it very clear that Cain went to him thinking he was going to get somebody who would listen to his complaint about God, but instead... He perhaps received a rebuke, but at least received, you know, encouragement to repent and to do the will of God. And that's not what he wanted. So Cain sacrificed his brother because God must have the best. Don't you see? Cain is full of spite and vengeance and evil. He's so angry with God. 
And he's so angry, you know, that his brother did better than he did. And that he could have made a better choice, but he didn't. You see how that's working? That's what's happening there. But Hebrews 11, to go back to it, told us through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. It didn't record for you back in Genesis what he said. It's only implied. But Hebrews 11.4 said that he spoke. We know that they had this conversation and it didn't go the way Cain wanted it to. But in the gospel, I would turn you, consider this that's written there. In John chapter 11, when Jesus waited for Lazarus to die of illness before going to their home, he arrived and Lazarus' sister Martha said, Lord, John eleven twenty one. 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, John 11, 24, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Yes, Abel, though he died, still speaks because whoever believes in him, in God, whoever believes in Christ, though he die, yet shall he live. Abel, though he died, still speaks, and it's recorded for us in Revelation. Remember Revelation chapter 1, when, uh, when the Lord uh, appears to John One of the things he says to him in the 17th verse and the 18th verse of Revelation 1, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Though he died, he still speaks. I died and behold, I am alive, he says. (laughs) You're not going to stop him. He's overcome death. And ultimately, we have to go to Romans 6. What shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound since we're forgiven by grace? Well, no. By no means. How can we who died to sin live any longer in it? Don't you know all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried with him by baptism into death in order that as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we'll be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know the old person was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, that we would no longer be enslaved to sin because the one who's died has been set free from sin. That's us. If we've died with Christ, we believe we'll live with him. We know Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God forevermore. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions Stop presenting your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. We live because he lives. Abel lives because Christ lives. You see, they're the same. We receive our commendation by faith. In the same way. It's the same God it always has been. Do you live today? Have you overcome death? 
having become a Christian, a child of God, obeying God, not just believing what he says, but doing what he says, becoming a Christian, a child of God. We have water here prepared that you might do what we see everybody did and has done ever since this started in Acts chapter 2, that you might be buried in baptism for forgiveness of sins. And God will declare you right. And you will have the hope of heaven. And you will be a new person, a new creature created in Christ Jesus for good works. Today, are you a Christian already having done these things, but perhaps have not followed through in these works, have not been active in the service of the Lord? Repent, make things right with God, pray for forgiveness in the heart as we read in Acts 8. But let us pray with you and for you that you might be restored to him and steal in your resolve to serve him and to overcome this. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing the song selected.